you to Testive Study Hall. This week we're going to be covering SAT reading passages. Study, studyhall.testive.com runs every Monday, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Um, Pacific, and you'll have to interpolate in between. I'm the real Tom Rose. I'm one of the co-founders of Testive, which is an online test prep company. Um, we're here to satisfy all of your test prep needs. Uh, right now we're offering test prep within the SAT sphere. It's going to have an ACT product out soon. I'm also a professional teacher. Um, I've done professional tutoring for about 10 years. And I'm also a professional writer. I do a bunch of the writing of the content that you see at Testive. And, and I've spent a bunch of time analyzing and you know, perfecting SAT reading and writing techniques. So that's where I get some of the expertise that I'll be sharing with you guys um, today on passages. So what are passages? Well, uh, passages represent 72% of all reading questions on the SAT. So it is a massive category of question. It's definitely something you're going to want to get underhand uh, before you make the leap to the SAT itself. It is the second most difficult type of question to improve on in my, in my humble experience. So that makes it uh, particularly challenging and, and is perhaps one of the reasons why so many of you wrote in asking for um, for things that are diff uh, for help with passage-based reading. Uh, number one in my experience is vocab. Um, so how do you get better at passages? Um, number one, take notes as you read. Super important. Um, also, a very uh, this is a very given out piece of advice and a very often skipped piece of advice. Uh, it's probably the single most important thing for you to start doing if you want to get better at reading passages. Um, I will talk more about what type of notes to take and how to keep that from slowing you down. In fact, how could it speed you up? Number two, understand the question type. So there are six different types of reading passages questions on the SAT, and there's a different strategy for every type. Um, so what you, want to know, what you want to be able to do is, is rapidly categorize the questions and deploy the appropriate strategy for them. And what that will do is keep you moving quickly. It will keep you from having to guess, uh, and it will get you more correct answers. Lastly, understand the purpose of each paragraph. So one of the things that the test is going to expect you to be able to do is take complicated um, reading passages, and, it, and it's going to expect you to understand the role of each uh, paragraph as uh, it fits into a context. And that context is often quite complicated. Um, so this is one of the main things that you're going to uh, be writing down as you take notes. But that's a key thing for you to keep track of. What is the role? Um, what is the purpose of each paragraph? So let's take a look at the passages landscape. Um, there's always 48 passage questions on the test. Um, the question mix by passage type varies. Um, so let me give you a sense of the passage types. There are four types of passages. You've got short, short paired, long, and long paired. Um, and you, as you can see, um, you have different number of passages per test. The number of passages per test is fairly consistent. It does change, but it's fairly consistent to what I have listed here. Um, the questions per passage is consistent for some of them. So short passages always have two, short, short paired always have four. But within the long and the long paired, you'll see that it's actually quite flexible. Different passages have different number of questions. So that's something that you may want to take a glance at as you're going through the test. Hey, how many questions are in this particular passage before you really commit so if you're doing a long passage that has 13 questions, that's going to warrant a different amount of time spent reading than a long passage that only has five questions, for example. So before we go too much further, it's important for you guys to know yourselves. So put yourself on this spectrum from overreader. Um, on one side of the spectrum to forager all the way on the other side. So type in the chat window, which one of these are you? Um, and if you're, if you're, even if you're not super extreme, um, always put yourself on one side. So nobody's perfectly balanced. The, the trick here is to, is to keep track of which way you lean so that you can consciously move toward the center. Okay, so we have a lot of overreaders and a few foragers. Okay, that's that's about normal. Usually it's about uh, 60, 40 readers to foragers. Oh, and here comes a bunch of wave of foragers here. <laughs> okay, so uh, of course some of the some of the advantages and disadvantages of reading and foraging. So advantage of reading 
of overreading is you have much higher understanding. Disadvantage of overreading is that it's slow. Um, advantage of foraging is that it's very fast. The disadvantage of foraging is that you have low understanding. And so what we're always in the hunt for is the mythical balance. We're always looking for the balanced read, which leads to balanced understanding and therefore balanced speed. So whichever one you are, you want to move toward the center. So if you tend to be an overreader, um, it's important for you to, to back off a little bit. And when I say back off a little bit, what I mean is, uh, let me describe what balanced read is. In a balanced read, you should still be reading the whole passage, right? You should still be, you know, processing each word. You should not be skipping things. Um, but what you should not be doing is slowing way down and going back to reread things, right? You want to do a single um, lightweight pass of all the content, right? So if you're an overreader, the risk is that you're spending too much time trying to really understand everything. If you're a forager, on the other hand, the risk is that you are that you are not um, perceiving all the details as they come by, and that maybe you're you're reading them, but they're kind of just going in and straight back out, and you're never really fully processing it. Right. So if you're a forager, what I want you to do um, is is do more deliberate reading. And when we talk about taking notes, one of the things that's specifically going to combat is the accidental habit of the forager to um, to read a paragraph but not really understand it or process it at all. Okay. So. Some of the techniques we'll talk about today are specifically going to move you toward the middle. So um, there are many, many different processes out there for how to, um, for how to go through reading passages. Um, however, not all of those processes work for people at the expert level. What you'll find is that as you get started, pretty much any process can work for you. Um, but some of those processes are going to fall apart as you become more advanced. And the process that I'm going to suggest for you is something that I have, I have seen work for both beginners that I've been working with, and it continues to work all the way up to expert levels. So this is the same process that I use when I go to take the SAT, um, and, and you know, I'm basically as high a level as you could be um, when it comes to reading comprehension. So this, this is a very versatile technique um, that you can start now, and you can just continue to use all the way up until you know, basically 800 at reading. Rashika is asking in the chat window, um, overreading may be slow, uh, but isn't answering the questions relatively easier and faster? Yes, it is, Rashik. So that, in fact, that is the stated advantage of overreading, um, is that you do have better comprehension, so you're faster on the questions. Um, however, the implication would be is that um, you're, it's not faster enough to warrant the overreading, right? So. By spending a little bit less time at the reading, you will be then slower at the questions, but not so much slower that it's that you're worse off. This is the this is one of the things that's challenging about an optimization is it's not it's not obvious how to how to turn the knob to go to hard to one of the rails or the other. It's actually a balance, and you really have to practice and get used to what's too fast, what's too slow, um, etc. All right, so here here is the process that I suggest, and and when it comes to reading passages. Remember I said before it's one of the most difficult areas to improve. Well, One of the, the reasons why it's difficult to improve is because at the base level what you're doing is reading. And that's a skill that you've been doing for almost 20 years already. So what, we're, what you're likely not going to do is fundamentally change the way that you read or how you understand while you read at this point. It is possible for you to do that, but that is a, that is a much bigger endeavor than most people typically set out to, to accomplish when they're prepping for the SAT. Um, instead, what I, what I would advocate for most people is that they focus on process, because process is something that you can control, and process is something that you can get better at really quickly, and it's something that will move your scores quickly in the right direction, and it'll make you a better reader and a faster reader. Okay, and because it's under your control, you can put some of these techniques into play immediately, and we're gonna do that today. So the goal here, optimize speed and comprehension, right? So we're not trying to be as fast. We're not optimizing all for speed, and we're not optimizing all for comprehension. We're looking for that balance. So the first thing is, read the whole passage first. Uh, well, so one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make 
um, when I start working with them is they some people have a strategy where they have a tendency to switch back and forth between the passage and the questions over and over. So they'll read a little bit, answer a question, read a little bit more, answer another question. This uh, is a, that's ex, that's a good example of the type of strategy that only works for easy level questions, and it 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 fails as you get into the more difficult stuff. And the reason why is because the test essentially requires that at the at the upper level require that you have an understanding across the entire passage. So if you're stopping in the middle, doing something and then coming back, you're forgetting things that you need to know. Um, so first step in process, make sure you read the whole passage first before you do any questions. Two, take notes while you read. We're going to do a, I'm going to talk specifically more about notes in one moment. But you should always take notes while you read. The, the purpose of that is to help keep you focused. Number three, answer questions um, on one passage at a time. Meaning, so there are multiple questions per passage. And what you want to do is complete a passage before you move on to another. It's very difficult to move on and then come back. So you really kind of get one shot for each, for each passage. You read it, you take your shot, uh, and then you're done. You can move on to the next one. But anything that you leave unfinished, it's unlikely that you're going to have time to come back and, and re-engage with that. So try to keep them segregated. Number four, identify the question type before answering. So if you're going through um, right now reading passages, and you don't know without a, beyond a shadow of a doubt what type of question each question is, then you're not being as efficient as you could be. There is a specific process that works for each question type. There's six types. Um, and, and what you don't want to do is have to figure that out every time. What you want to do is classify and then execute. And that's the type of thing that makes you faster and more confident, pushes your scores up, um, and saves time for harder questions toward the end of the section. Um, Sagar is asking a great question. Should you do questions that are specific to line numbers first? No, I don't advocate that. Typically, um, the questions are roughly in order of how they appear in the passages already. So any, any kind of ordering that you would want to do with questions is basically already done for you. So I do think that there's probably is a strategically um, better route through the questions. But that strategically best route is the route that they are already laid out for you. That's one of the things that is actually quite civilized about reading passages on the SAT, is that you don't need to spend a bunch of time and effort um, parsing your route through the questions. So read the passage, and then go through the questions one by one in the order that they're presented. Uh, Ruby, that is good advice, reading before and after. We'll come back to that. Um, and lastly, apply the appropriate question strategy. So this goes with identifying the question type. First identify the type, then apply the appropriate strategy. So uh, don't change your process passage by passage type. This is another one of the great things about um, reading passages on the SAT is that the process that, that I was just outlining, it works for all passage types. Short, short paired, long, long paired. So that further simplifies things which allows you to focus on execution. Um, why do we do this? Why don't we change our strategy for different passages? Well, one, there's not really any need. The strategy that we have is going to work just fine for all types. And, and two, it's going to allow you to, to keep a simpler strategy in mind so that you're able to focus on the execution of that strategy. Right? Rather than having to focus and think about how to game the test and do complicated things to come up with a slightly more optimal routing of this or that, or um, we have a very simple, straightforward strategy um, that works at low level, it works at high level, works on easy questions, works on hard questions. So you can really focus on, on how well you're doing and not worry too much about, about the gaming. Right? So you can just focus on the reading, the material, um, and on getting those questions correct. Okay, so a um, couple of questions that were coming in the chat window before were asking, um, how should you take notes? Great question. This is a really important thing um, for you to do well. Um, uh, let's see. Op goals here for taking notes. Um, optimize your speed. The goals are to optimize your speed and comprehension. And two, to stay focused. Um, one of the things that you'll find is really difficult. Um, and per personally, I, I have, a, I have a, uh, a really large challenge with this. Is While I'm reading passages on the test, I tend to get very bored. And it's easy for me to lose focus. And when I lose focus, 
what what will happen is I kind of go into a zombie mode, and then I'll sort of wake up, and I'll realize that I've read half a passage and I wasn't even paying attention. Sometimes the opposite will happen. Sometimes what will happen is I'll get really tired, and I'll be reading passages and I'll find that I'm going really slowly. So now I have bad speed. So there's a lot of a lot of dangers that you can encounter that will be protected by taking notes. Now. Um, what is one of the downsides of taking notes? Um, and one of the things that you need to get better about is when you write things down, those things tend to, uh, that takes time to write things down. So what I want you to do is be able, is to take notes, but do it really quickly. And let me show you, let me show you the technique that I suggest for taking notes in a way that does not slow you down. In fact, if you do it this way, many students find that this actually speeds them up. It's a very lightweight process. And it helps you focus yourself. So there's actually l less downtime. You'll end up being faster. The first thing is understand the purpose of these, each paragraph. This is something that you need to do anyway. right? Uh, while you're reading, you're going to have to understand the purpose of each paragraph. So this is just a reminder to do that at the end of each paragraph. Great question in the chat window. Where do we write the notes? Um, and margins is the answer. Unfortunately, there's not very much room. So often, as you write these notes, they're going to be kind of squished in. Um, I like to circle them so that they kind of stand out so I can keep track of them better. Uh, but that is a bit of a struggle. Um, what you'll see in a moment is that I recommend taking very, very, very small amounts of notes. We're talking, you know, like two or three words per paragraph. So it's not, it's not a whole lot of prose. To um, write a short uh, one to six word note for each paragraph. So we're really just looking for the smallest note that you can write to yourself that will remind you what the purpose for this paragraph is. Um, number three, uh, review all your notes after reading. So when you're done with that passage, you've got, depending on how many paragraphs were in that passage, you've got you know, maybe between two and eight notes. Um, go back and reread all of those notes to get a really fast snap overview of the, of the passage itself, which hopefully, if you've been doing this well, will help the entire purpose of that passage really gel so you can completely understand the author's purpose. OK, so actually, before I put that up, let me stop here for questions uh, about how to take notes. Is In a moment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a passage up for you guys, and I want you to read through it and then and take notes on it. So if you have any questions about it, uh, let's get those out now. Josh, does this all apply to the SAT too? Um, it does, um, but I'm really meaning to give SAT advice here, and I'm and I'm a very much an SAT expert, but not very much an SAT two expert. So I don't want to I don't want to overstep my my expertise there. But from what I know about the SAT two, it it does apply. But maybe somebody some of the other students actually could comment. Um, Tanya, should you take notes on passages as a whole also? Personally, I don't do that. Um, there's, of course, there's always a balance. Um, that's one of the types of things that I try to just keep in my head. Fevin, do you recommend answering questions after each paragraph? No, I do not recommend that. I specifically think you should go through and read the entire thing all at once, then move over to the questions. And uh, we mentioned it a little bit before, but the reasoning again here is that it's really important for you to understand the entire passage in context which means you need, to, you need to read the paragraphs together so that you can understand how they relate to one another. If you stop and read a passage and then come back, st stop, answer a question, and then come back, you lose track of what's going on, and it prevents you from getting the complete understanding. Yeah, these are the same methods suggested by all the other coaches at Testiv. How many passages are there again? Uh, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven passages on the SAT, generally speaking. Sometimes they split it and there's eight. So Elaine, uh, what do I do if I, if I, so what happens if you make a mistake and suddenly you wake up and you realize you haven't read something, you've read something but you didn't remember it or process it? You have to go back and reread. Um, it's one of those things that you, you basically don't ever want to happen. So as you practice, you want to develop a technique for preventing that from happening. Um, taking notes specifically will prevent that. Because since you'll be writing a note after each paragraph, that, that actually does give you a, a tiny little break for you to kind of 
come back to your senses, and then you can start in on that next paragraph. Um, so Laurel, uh, when you, you'll see the difference between short, um, between paired and non-paired passages. Paired passages are, uh, it's example of basically two passages that they give you, and those two passages are associated. And um, they'll, they'll ask you questions, and sometimes the questions will compare one passage to the other. Um, it is completely explained on the test itself, and you'll see it when you go to sit down. So I would take a practice test as soon as possible if you haven't if you haven't done so already, and you'll see them in there. How many practice passages should you do? So let me actually let me take that offline, and we'll do it at the end of the session, and we'll get back to some more of the general questions. Don't let me forget. So ask that again um, if we if if I don't remember. So let's let's move on to a passage. I've got one. This is this is one that we have taken from. Uh, from the College Board official um, SAT guide, what we call the Blue Book, second edition. So this is a real long passage. I'm going to put this up here, and what I want you to do is, is read through it and take notes on it. So get a pencil and paper, and on your paper, and write down what you would write down on the SAT if you were reading this passage. I'll give you a minute, and then we'll come back and we'll compare notes. All right. This is this is about the timing where um, you should be wrapping up. If you're faster than this, um, that's great. If you're still working, go ahead and keep working. Uh, but you want to you want to try to wrap up soon. So let's um, let's compare notes. Um, Rashik uh, Rashik has a question. Is that good timing? Um, the important thing uh, in, in the sense of timing, and I think this is a really good way to practice, is practice uh, reading sections out of the blue book using the official pacing. So for example, when you do questions in the blue book, they'll come in a 24 minute section, right? And what you can do is answer the questions in that section in that 24 minutes. So in 24 minutes, you can get a baseline on your timing. Because people read passages and answer questions themselves, on different timings, um, 
you really need to do both all together in order to get a sense of it. So let's compare notes. So for the um, personally, I don't take any notes for the italic portion. Did you did you guys have any? If you, if so, go ahead and share them. Okay, I'm not getting any there. So let's let's go on to the first paragraph. So type what note you had for uh, for this first paragraph here. A Kagongo proverb states dot dot dot. Go ahead and type those into the chat window and send them in so we can compare. Roots are important, heritage is important, so are all great. I had heritage important, that's what I wrote. Inborn curiosity of origins, that's interesting. Origin, so yeah, I think the key theme here and the word that you want to have is something with origins, heritage, roots, something like that. So Kira, one cannot stop curiosity. I think that's a little too general. The author goes a little bit deeper than that. Alexander, yours is a, it's a good note, it's a little long. All right, so let's compare notes for second paragraph. Black Americans have managed dot, dot, dot. What did you have for that? Okay, black Americans are still with Africa. Tanya, I assume that's a good note for you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't quite understand it, but that's not important. What, all that matters is that, that you understand it. When you say with Africa, um, as long as it's clear to you that what you mean is that, you know, it's with them in their mind. Yeah, so we have ties. The word ties is, is used frequently. Did they use the word ties literally in the passage? Is that why everybody has that? Yeah, it does. Ties, so that's a good word. Ties, though, separated, I like that. Links to origins. Um, right, so the keys here are some kind of connection to Africa. Right, and you definitely want to have in your mind the concept of Africa, and you want to have a reference here to some kind of connection. So this paragraph is all about that connection. And let's go down to number three. What did you have in your notes for a third paragraph? This is a tricky one. A lot of people having strived to understand each other, but what? There's sort of a but in here. That's an important part of the tone in that third paragraph. Yeah, Josh is starting to get to it here. Expectations not always met. That's a really important concept. That it's not just that they have a connection, that they have actually a fake connection. Right, so this paragraph says, for centuries we have gazed at one another across the divide like a child seeing itself in a mirror for this first time, and un unable to reach beyond the glass and touch the familiar face, we filled in all that we did not know with what we could imagine. So it's important here is that the person has a concept that there's other people, but that they're not actually interacting, so they're kind of making up the connection. The connection is sort of um, invented, right? It's, it's, you're not seeing a person. What you're actually seeing is a reflection of yourself. It 
It does, and it does. This is this is supported again in the last paragraph. Uh, let's see, what did we have? We have longing leading to fake connection. So the, I hear a lot of longing and a lot of um, yearning in paragraph three, and it leads to a connection, but that connection is somewhat fake. Okay, and let's take a look at fourth paragraph. What did you have in your notes for that? Josh, try to get try to put something down. The the paragraph must have some purpose. Because so paragraph three is about how that connection is fake, and then paragraph four kind of brings it back around to to what. So this is the one that I think is giving the class the most trouble. I, Enrique, I really like that one. I really like Enrique. It says, the connection remains strong despite disappointment. That really captures the tone, Enrique, right? So paragraph three was some of that disappointment, or the setting up of the disappointment. Paragraph four is the realization of that disappointment. It says, hey, we finally got in touch when we realized you know, we actually don't know anything about each other. We've been apart for too long. But despite that, there's still a connection. So Josh, I also like this one. Connection still has value. That's a really good one, um, especially because of the word still. You say connection still has value. The still implies that something is broken. Uh, and there is something broken here. And that really captures the tone of this author. So here's what, um, here are the notes that we have. And by the way, I just put example notes here because it's not to say that these are the correct notes. There's no correct um, notes. This is a bit of an art form. Uh, but there, there are important concepts, and we talked about some of the important concepts. So for paragraph one, you want to have some kind of concept for heritage, right? Heritage, roots, origin, something like that. Second paragraph, the, kind of, the concept that you want to have in there is some kind of linkage back to Africa. So you could have the word ties. You could have a link, connection, I, I saw from people. And something about Africa, unless you have Africa in your, in your mind and you don't have the need to write it down. But as long as you're imagining that, that works. Uh, paragraph three, uh, an important concept to come up here is, with here is not only uh, about the connection, but that there's a problem with the connection. It's an important concept in, in paragraph three. This is, this is where um, some advanced questions are going to come from. Okay, that longing leads to a connection that is actually imagined. So you want to have some concept in there about the imagining or the fake or the not realness of the connection. And then in um, last paragraph, um, you want to bring it back around. So the passage very much has a, even though it was fake, we still do have something real. So you want to have both of those pieces. I think Josh had a really great one. It was, connection still has value. Okay, a bunch of people are curious about Hannah's question. Should the notes be more literal or interpretive? The notes should be um, interpretive. I guess maybe, Hannah, if you could say more about your question. What's important for you guys to do is, is jot down the purpose of that paragraph. So it may depend on the passage. In some passage, if the passage is very straightforward, right? If, let's, let's say it's telling a story about something that happened. And four things happen, one in each paragraph. You might have very literal notes, and that might be totally fine, because it's a story. Um, in this particular passage, where the author is being very figurative, it's important for the notes to be more figurative, to match. Does that answer your question, Hannah? Yes, OK. And for those of you who are, who are putting the up arrows, uh, let me know if I didn't get your question either. OK, so lastly, 
Um, use the appropriate question, appropriate strategy for each question type. And this is where we're, we're going to have a, a bit of a cliffhanger here. But uh, we're not going to go over all of these question types today. That's going to come up next time. Uh, but I do want to show them all to you. So here are all of the question types in reading. And next time, we're going to go over the strategies for each one of these. But the last important overall concept in passages is you should be able to categorize each of these and know the strategy that goes with it. Um, if you would like to skip ahead, the strategies for each of these are listed at testive.com. Um, just go to testive.com, click on the Resource Center, and you can read each of the strategies that go with each one. This is a paper written on each one. But I have an example question in here. So main idea is the primary passage is to. It's the idea that it's looking at the passage as a whole. Specific questions will refer by citation to a certain section. Hide and seek will ask you about something but will not have a citation. It will ask you to hunt for something. Um, attitude questions um, will ask about the author's feeling right, or tone or, or attitude. Vocabulary questions will ask you about the meaning of a word. So it'll say the message is characterized as. And lastly, technique, where um, they will ask about literary devices. So if you would like, you can go look up strategies for each question type at testive.com slash resources. Uh, we will cover these strategies specifically in next week's study hall. Um, also, you can get further practice um, for the SAT in general. We do all areas, all categories, all subcategories. You can get that practice at www.testive.com. There's practice questions, practice tests. Uh, there's written explanations and video answer explanations for questions. And you can also subscribe to work with a one-on-one -on -one 99 percentile scoring coach if you would like some specific personalized attention. I'd like to acknowledge all the people that helped put this together. So Miro, Miro, Kaz, Kazakoff, Jackson, Havid, Noel, David, Pikachu, Chippendale, Lee, the chemist, Akamando, Shonak, the closer, Patel, Morella, Brazil, Crespi, David, Chubby Shorts, High Song, Charles, Kitten Smuggler, Reese, Abby, the Saint, Engelstead, Will, the Institute, Eaton, and Meg, Smiles, Butler. This has been studyhall.testive.com, Mondays, 9 p.m. Thank you all so much for coming. I hope you will stick around and give us some feedback.